Thanks, everybody, for coming. My name is John Hug. I work on the VoltDB project in Boston. And I'm here to talk about uh, what we've done in terms of leveraging determinism in distributed systems for performance and testing. Uh, and, and I'll give my usual disclaimer that there are some slides in this talk that could be 40-minute talks by themselves. Uh, I can't go into some of the things I can't go into tons of detail with here. But I'm happy to talk afterward um, or, or contact me via email. Um, I'd love to talk about this stuff. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So getting started, uh, you need a replicated setup. You've got a constantly updating database server, and you want to have two or more constantly updating database server. What are your options? Um, so number one, you could run a primary server and a replica server pair. Uh, and you could send a change log from the primary to the replica, either synchronous or asynchronous. This is really common. Um, you could allow writes to two different servers or, or multiple servers, do conflict detection, uh, merge all the writes, maybe last write wins, come up with some strategy for how you're going to merge all these writes. Um, but this, these are not the choices we made. These are sort of the, the, the kind of existing situations. Uh, we're looking for something that, that's materially better than these. Uh, so active, active in theory using determinism. If I've got my state A, and I apply deterministic operation X, I end up with state B. If state A is on one, one replica and I've got another replica of state A down here, if I apply deterministic operation X down here to this other copy of state A, I end up with a second copy of state B. Moving this one step forward, if I've got state A plus deterministic operation X plus Y and Z, uh, I end up with state C. And if I do that on my second copy of state A, I end up with state C. And I can extrapolate this out as far as I want. So in practice, what you could end up with is a client that sends operations A, B, and C. It could be multiple clients, but just simple here. Uh, into a coordination system which says, all right, the order is going to be A, B, and C for these deterministic operations. And it's going to send A, B, and C ordered to replica, the first replica. It's going to send A, B, and C ordered to the second replica. Those replicas are going to, in parallel, perform those deterministic operations. And I'm going to feel confident at the end that the replicas are going to have the same state. So this is an active-active. All writes are done to all replicas of the data. Um, but I don't have to worry about uh, conflict detection, last write wins kind of stuff. Uh, and even more simple, uh, connect for good, plinko bad. So the ABC thing here is a logical log, right? I do the same things in the same order to two copies of the same state. This order is the important thing. The order of operations is a log. I can replicate this log over the network for active-active intercluster replication. I can also write this log to disk so that if something goes wrong and I want to get back to where I was, I can replay it later in deterministic order and get to the same state I had before I crashed. Uh, I can even send this log over the network to uh, another data center, maybe across the country, replay the log there, and end up with the same state. Um, VoltDB does this. VoltDB does this. VoltDB does this, except we don't do this anymore. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of cover why in a little bit. Um, but a little detour on uh, how to get away with this. You need to be aware of sources of non-determinism in your operations. Uh, the most obvious ones are uh, random numbers and wall clock time. If you use in your operations random numbers and wall clock time, uh, you're not going to be deterministic. So same thing with procedure code. If you're running an operation uh, that's got some Java code or Scala code or something, and it's, it's using random numbers and wall clock time, uh, you've got to be aware that that could be deterministic, non-deterministic as well. Sometimes uh, record order can be non-deterministic. If I've got some twins in my birthday set and I say delete the newest person from my birthday set, uh, then I don't know, maybe in one case, the record order, I'm going to delete person three. But over here, I'm going to delete person four. Because their birthdays are the same, uh, it may be a non-deterministic change. External systems is a big one. Uh, so if I'm in the middle of my procedure, uh, I do begin an operation. Maybe in the middle, I want to go find out what the weather is and store that in my system. Uh, well, if I have to go to an external system to get the weather, maybe when I'm replaying my log 10 minutes later, the weather has changed, I'm going to get a different answer. Maybe the weather service is going to be down and I'm going to get a, a, an error message. Uh, all these things introduce non-determinism. If you need to talk to another system, you need to do that at the client side or outside of the scope of the deterministic operation that you're logging. And uh, this is something that uh, 
applies if you're using like Spark Streaming or some of these other uh, non-deterministic, no side effect kind of processing systems. Uh, there's some interesting things we've run into at Volt, non-user sources of non-determinism. Um, obviously, bad memory is one of them. If you're trying to do these things with, uh, without ECC memory, uh, you're probably going to have a bad time. Um, interestingly, there are libraries out there that for security purposes randomize the orders of things that they do. Uh, they're trying to avoid hackers like figuring out that you're doing the same thing over and over or where memory lives. Um, but these also break your non-determinism. A lot of times people complain when someone introduces like this. The security people say yay, the data people space people say boo. Uh, so something to be aware of. Uh, so if we've got these sources of non-determinism, how do we guarantee that it's not going to mess up your app? How do we protect you from, uh, from the user accidentally introducing non-determinism? Uh, well, one of the things we've done at Vault is we've made sure that our SQL is as, not, as deterministic as possible. Um, so the SQL planner understands what is deterministic and what is not. Uh, we've made 100% of our DML, that is our write SQL, our inserts, our updates, and our deletes deterministic. There's no way for you to write a, a non-deterministic DML statement. Uh, interestingly, there are ways to write non-deterministic read statements. For performance reasons, uh, for memory uh, size reasons, there are a couple of reasons why it's nice to be able to do this from time to time. And we've decided not to make all SQL deterministic. Uh, however, we do know that if you've got a transaction that's mixing a read and write, uh, we, will slow, we will plan the read in a deterministic way so that you can't take a non-deterministic read and feed that into a write. Uh, so, so we've made our planner aware of this stuff so that it can make the right trade-offs to make it very, very difficult to run a, a non-deterministic transaction. Um, there are some times uh, as a result of the first bullet point where we, we can't actually guarantee it's non-deterministic and we will warn you when you load that procedure code. Uh, we also offer deterministic APIs. Uh, we will give you a, a seeded random number generator that has, that has uh, seeds that are going to be deterministic. We'll give you the, the, the logical time that your transaction is actually executing as opposed to the wall clock time, which you, know, you shouldn't trust your system wall clock time anyway. Um, we, we do this other weird trick uh, to, to avoid uh, divergence. So say I've got this procedure foo, and this is fairly typical for a procedure. I've got some logic, some read SQL, some logic, some write SQL, some logic, some read SQL, some logic, some write SQL, return a response. Um, the write SQL is the only thing that can modify state. So what we do is we actually hash up what the write SQL you asked us to do was, as well as the parameters, any parameters you fed into that write SQL. And, and it just comes up with a nice little, uh, Either, either you, know, you can hash it all up and you get a single 64-bit number, or you can hash up as, a, as an array of numbers. They're all very, a lot smaller uh, to communicate that over a network than a lot of things. Um, and so when we run these things, the client talks to the coordinator and says, I'd like to do this deterministic operation. The coordinator says, all right, well, I'm going to do it in this order. Now it's your turn. I'm going to send it to my replicas and perform that operation. The replicas perform the operation, but they, com they compute the response, what you asked for, they make any changes to the state that you asked for, but they also compute this hash of all the changes to state that you made. That information is pushed back to the coordinator, and the coordinator can actually confirm that these hashes are the same. These two things did the same deterministic DML with the same parameters to the same state in the same order. So if we can guarantee all this, then we can actually we, we get some um, we can take advantage of determinism without being super afraid. Uh, we are a little bit afraid, so we've got some belt and suspenders checks. Uh, well, VoltDB is capable of, uh, like a lot of systems, of sort of a copy on write transactional snapshot that's cluster wide. Uh, so if two replicas are performing a uh, snapshot that's at the same time, uh, then we can basically take a hash of that as we're computing it. And if the hash is different, we know that they're di the replicas are different. If the hash is the same, we know they're the same. This is an out of band check. It doesn't check lively, it checks every time you take a snapshot, which is every so often. Um, we could do more. As I hinted before, uh, we do let you write non-deterministic reads because they can in times be faster and use less memory. Um, we could make that different decision. We could not allow non-deterministic reads. Uh, it's kind of a constant trade-off between how often people get into trouble and how fast people want to run. 
Um, there's also things we could do that we haven't done. We haven't done a lot of uh, like deep code inspection in people's Java store procedures, looking for sources of non-determinism. Um, there's a few more kinds of protections that we could take that we're talking about, and some of the things we started work on. But we, some of this is just engineering effort. Uh, so performance. Um, why do we do this? And, and performance is really the biggest reason. Uh, one side trip here, just to, to come across how, how uh, deterministic operations, in, in our case, these are, these are procedural procedures. So if, say my procedures make a pizza, and the parameters are I want a large pizza with ham and olives, what that expands to is a whole lot of logic. And so one thing is that in the case where you're doing intensive processing, um, then, then oftentimes the, the invocation of the deterministic operation is much smaller to send over the network than the actual intensive pro processing. In some cases, it's smaller than ex actually explaining all the data mutations as well. It's a very compact representation and, uh, of, of kind of what you're trying to do. So we've got a deterministic logical log for synchronous repl replication. Why do we do this? This is the performance why slide here. Um, we can replicate faster. And when I say faster, I should say lower latency replication. Um, we can do both things simultaneously on two replicas or on M replicas, rather than doing them one and then the other, or doing them on a primary replica and sending binary change logs to other replicas. Uh, what this means is that our latency, when you add replication, does not substantially change. It changes a little bit because you have different, you know, you, you can have different worst case performance and things, but. But for the most part, if we have a millisecond latency without replication, you add replication, it's like one point something. Um, so this is a huge advantage if you're trying to build safe systems that are also fast. The trade-off between uh, synchronous replication and low latency is almost gone. We can persist faster. So by logging, logging this deterministic operation of the disk, what we can do is we can start logging when we decide what the order is. Most systems do the work and then log all the data that's changed to disk. So they do the work, that takes some amount of time, and then they log the work, that takes some amount of time, and then they wait for an F sync to disk because that's something that's important to do if you really care. Uh, and all those things take time one after another, much like the replication, by doing, uh, by doing this logical log, we can do them at the same time. It becomes a race. I start logging, I take a batch commit to disk where I F sync maybe you know, 10 to 100 transactions at once, and I'm also doing those transactions in memory. Uh, so if my uh, disk, whether I've got a controller or an SSD, is capable of f-syncing at one millisecond, uh, f-syncing every millisecond, then a lot of times I'm not adding a, a substantial amount of latency to my operation. Um, so that's a huge benefit. And as I said before, sort of with the pizza thing, um, this gets us bounded size operations too. So if the client describes to us a workload over a gigabit Ethernet connection, or a set of clients describe a workload over a gigabit Ethernet connection, logging that to disk is not going to be bigger than a gigabit Ethernet connection, which is actually pretty easy to log. Sending that over a network is not going to be bigger than another gigabit Ethernet connection. Whereas when you get into binary logs, sometimes the binary log might be smaller than the logical representation, sometimes it might be much, 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 much bigger. Um, so this is where I'd like send off a foghorn kind of because this is the key performance slide, um, but that would be rude. Uh, what it, so what? So per node we're doing 100 to 500 thousand acid transactions per second. Um, there's a lot of caveats and things here, but you know we have customers who are running at these rates, so it's not uh, you know the caveats are not made up caveats. They're they're caveats people live with in the real world. Um, millions of SQL statements per second. Now, like, just like with the pizza example, the actual work you're doing in the transaction is not super correlated with how big the, actual, the number of transactions are. All the coordination overhead, all the network overhead is per transaction. The actual work done in the procedure can, is, can scale pretty well. So I can add more logic, add more SQL. It often doesn't slow down my system at all. Uh, it certainly depends on the SQL. Uh, we've measured linear scale to 30 nodes. That number is not large from like a distributed system standpoint. When we're running millions of SQL statements per second, it's pretty large for a lot of uh, the kind of operational workloads we're working on. Um, and it's not that 30 is a number that like we think it bombs after that. We just haven't really tested. We've tested bigger clusters than that, but we haven't really set up the benchmarking environments to really verify that the linear scaling goes past that. Um, 
Also, as I said before, synchronous replication and synchronous disk persistence. We have customers who are getting a millisecond or so average latency on synchronous disk writes with long tail that's really not looking terrible. Um, this is sort of a boring key value diversion. Uh, key value CRUD is, is pretty trivially deterministic. Uh, key value CRUD, also the binary and the logical, there's no real difference between that. Um, it, from a distributed standpoint, uh, determinism, key value is not that interesting. Um, so what are some of the trade-offs and compromises we're making by doing this? Because clearly there are some, right? Everything's got a trade-off. Uh, number one is that it's, it's more engineering work. We do a lot of work on testing determinism, on enforcing determinism. We do a lot of documentation on explaining how to our customers how to take advantage of these things, what things are possible, what things are not. Um, you know, that, 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 that certainly takes effort. Uh, another big uh, issue, running mixed versions when you rely heavily on determinism is really scary, uh, especially when you're running things like SQL. And the scariest part about this is that, uh, say we have version 5.6 and someone finds a SQL bug where we have null handling is wrong for some random thing. It's not like an acid bug, it's a, just a random SQL bug. Uh, if we fix that in 5.7, then you no longer get deterministic operation when you run the same query on 5.6 and 5.7. Uh, this is something we're working on, but right now we don't support doing an, uh, a rolling upgrade between major versions of the software. We only support minor versions, and we're very careful when we fix SQL bugs because they break our rolling upgrade capability. That's a big trade-off. Um, not that we can't answer it eventually, it just goes back to the more work thing. Uh, trade-off number three, the non-determinism safety checks. Right now, if you trip them, uh, what we do is we snapshot your divergent replicas and we shut down the cluster. Um, so I can say that we have not had someone do this in production in over a year. Um, and and in, in even in the case where they, in, in, even in production, it's not, not in most of our customers uh, never hit this in production. This is a thing where people hit this while they're testing. People hit this during sort of the, the kicking the tires phase of VoltDB. Um, it's, it's a big trade-off. But it's something that very often, once you understand what, what is allowed and what's not, people, hit, people don't hit this in production with their systems. Uh, it is something we'd like to sort of address. It's a difficult thing to address based on some other constraints that I could talk about offline if people are interested. Um, I think the important thing about that, though, is that your data is safe. And both copies that have diverged are safe. Uh, but your availability goes away briefly. Uh, testing, so moving on to the second half of this talk, how do we leverage all this determinism to test? So testing any distributed system like Volt, uh, we've got to test ACID guarantees we make. Uh, we've got to test SQL correctness, integrations with things like Kafka and Hadoop. Uh, performance testing is really important because that's a big selling point of our software. Operational procedures like restart, upgrade, uh, all the different clients we support. We're going to focus on, on the ACID testing, the guarantees that we make for this second part of the talk, and we're gonna really focus on sort of one particular way we do that. Um, to review ACID briefly, uh, the properties for databases, atomic means that either all my writes happen or they don't. Uh, there's no half my writes complete. Consistent is weird. This is not the C that's from CAP. This is a different kind of consistent. It typically means that all my constraints in my schema have been enforced. If I say something is unique, it's actually unique. Uh, if I say this foreign key joins this foreign key, then it does. Um, Isolated means there's no interference between concurrent operations. And durable means that uh, once an operation commits, the concurrency control isn't going to say, no, never mind, actually, I'm kidding, it didn't commit. Um, isolation levels, this is sort of a breakout of the I in ACID. Uh, I'm only going to focus on serializable. Right now, all we support is serializable because, because of the way we use determinism, all we actually can support is serializable. We have to do one thing after another deterministically. Uh, so we, we, this is the sort of guarantee that we make. It just happens to be the strongest one and the best one, sort of a coincidence. Uh, but what we say basically is any pair of operations must have a possible logical ordering. Uh, you must be able to say that one thing happened before another. There's no overlap allowed. It's possible there are more than uh, one ordering. Uh, if things don't, don't uh, conflict at all, then you could probably order those ops any way you want. But there's at least one. And I'm not going to worry about the others. Uh, Google these, it's really interesting. Uh, a lot of the databases ship by default with much weaker isolation levels. Um, 
Last year at, at Strange Loop, uh, Will from Foundation DB, who's sitting over in the back here, uh, gave a really cool talk on simulation, using deterministic simulation to test distributed systems. Um, it's on YouTube. Watch it if you're interested. It's a really cool talk. Um, but it's about how, they, the, how the Foundation DB team used uh, deterministic simulation, a system called Flow, really cool, to, to test their software. Um, we went a different way, uh, also leveraging determinism. Um, we have a lot of respect for what they did, especially uh, the, the fact that with simulation, you can kind of exhaust testing all the different states in your state machines. Uh, and compressing time is a huge thing that you get from some of these simulations. You're able to test many, many, many more, um, longer periods of testing compressed into much lower because you don't have to use real clocks. Uh, we have a lot more states in VoltDB than, than a system that does transactional key value storage. Um, we've, I, I kind of get to some of the things that we've sort of added to our coordination model, um, but this is one of those things where I can talk kind of offline, but it would be a lot of work for us to do sort of exhaustive simulations. Um, and, and the simulation, you know, can't find bugs that are outside of the core state machines. So if you're not, if the simulation tests your core coordination logic, you can verify that that core coordination logic is, is valid for all possible state transitions. But outside of that, you've got to do other tests. So for the time being, we believe that we get more value out of the engineering uh, person hours spent the, testing the way that we're testing. Um, and we're very confident in the result. Uh, one of the side notes of why we're confident is that the serializable stuff is actually a little bit simpler to test. Um, but, but talking a little bit here about uh, how we actually test these things. So how do we test ACID? Um, we do have sort of a state machine fuzzing simulation that we built. Uh, this, says, this sort of fuzzes messages between different state machines. This is a thing that we built um, when we were developing our current concurrency protocol or consistency, the, the, the actual engine that maintains consistency in Volt that distributes transactions. Uh, we built this thing and it was super, super useful for, de for the initial development. It hasn't found a bug in years. Um, we could expand it, we could do more, more work there, make it closer to some of the stuff that FoundationDB is doing, um, but that's a sort of a different topic. Uh, unit tests, obviously, uh, smoke tests that sort of try one particular weird thing, maybe one thing a customer found. These are things that all developers have to run through before any code is committed to, to any branch, pretty much. Um, but what we really have here uh, that we, we get the most value out for testing ACID is a self-checking workload. So how do we le leverage the internal checking that Volt does? We talked about how it does, it does hashes, it does checksums of the right operations you're doing, and it verifies that I'm making the same operations to two uh, replicas at the same time in the same order. Can we leverage this? So if you read a value in SQL, uh, we don't put that in the hash. But if then I write that into the database, that information goes in the hash. So all, if I want to verify that I've read something correctly, all I have to do is write it. So we have this testing workload, sort of when in doubt, write it to, the, write it to state. Everything written to state is going to get self-checked by the system. Um, so our plan is to build a nefarious app. And our current app is called Transaction ID Self-Check 2. The first version of this thing, Self-Check 1, was written to test that Vault could guarantee unique transaction IDs for each, when you, when you asked our API, give me the transaction ID, and that that transaction ID would always be the same across replicas without coordinating. Uh, it's self-checked because it relies on this uh, determinism checks that we built into the product. And two is the version of it that once I saw uh, one of our engineers, Ning, built this transaction ID self-check thing, um, we said, well, we can expand that and use it to test a lot more things. This is sort of a brilliant idea. And so two is the second version that's more nefarious, um, and it's never, we don't have a three, two has just been added to over the years. So what does an app that tests for determinism look like? Um, I'm gonna do ACID again. I'm gonna go through the four properties and how we test these things, um, but I'm not gonna do them in any particular order because it's not the right, A is not the most interesting one to do first. So I for isolation, um, say I have this transaction, right? I read a value X, I increment X, and then I read X again for verification. If I run this concurrently, right, I have a client just flood the system with these things, um, then if any of them are stepping on each other's toes, it's possible that I could read the second time the wrong value of x. Maybe x is an x plus 1 the second time I read it. Right? So, so this is a system that could, it certainly doesn't guarantee, 
that it's going to tell, find isolation bugs, but it's capable of detecting isolation bugs using our, our software. Uh, for atomic, I can do similar kinds of things. I've got a read value x, increment x. Maybe I want to abort and roll back here, right? Uh, increment x, read value x. Maybe I want to abort and roll back there. Uh, read value x for verification. So this is an expansion of the isolated procedure, but it rolls back. And one of the interesting things here is that x should never be odd. That's like a new constraint that I can check. Um, because this thing always has two increments in it, it either completely rolls back or it completely happens. If x is ever odd, then I know I failed a constraint. D for durable. Uh, academically, you can argue about whether the D in acid it has anything to do with disks. Um, I personally don't think that that's what they were talking about. Um, but everyone thinks D means disks, so I'm going to talk about disks. Uh, build a data verifier that can inspect the state and give a thumbs up or a thumbs down at any time. We have that. Build a committed tuple checker, uh, and tuple is maybe the wrong word, but committed transaction checker to verify that constraints are met on recovery. And I, I've got another slide that sort of talks about how we built that. Uh, the last one is consistent. And as I said, this is sort of make sure your values are unique. Uh, make sure that your foreign keys are constrained. We don't even support foreign key enforced in, in VoltDB. Uh, this is mostly tested for us through unit tests um, and through SQL, the other things that we do for SQL. There's a whole other talk on how we test SQL. Um, so I'm going to sort of punt on, on, on consistent for the rest of the talk. Uh, so we started for isolation with this transaction over here. Begin read value x, increment x. Um, and it might find bugs, but it might not. You're kind of crossing your fingers and hoping for a race condition. So how can we make this workload nastier so that we can have, we're, we're almost certainly going to have a race condition. Uh, so here's a simple thing we could do. Instead of doing it once, do it 10 times. Right? Make the transaction take longer. And by making it take longer, the odds that you're going to interfere go up. Uh, the other thing is you get a neat little constraint here. Uh, just like the other one had to be odd, in this case, you need to, you need, now your value of x needs to be a multiple of 10. Um, but maybe we want to do something else. We could set x equal to the hash of x. Right? So this is weird where maybe you could have two things that sort of by chance get lucky and cancel each other's out. If x is hash of x, maybe you don't. And that's sort of an example that's simple, but we can get more and more crazy here. Um, why not have two values, x and y? Set y equal the previous value of x. Set x is hash of x. Verify that both are true. Um, all of these things are sort of moving in the direction of building a transaction that's more likely to find faults in your system. So the actual thing we run, uh, which I'm going to describe a simplified version of next, uh, is m even more complicated than the simplified version I'm going to say. Uh, we've added to it over the years as we've sort of found new, new we've extended our coordination system to new things, and, uh, and it, 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 it's a very, very nasty transaction. Um, but let's take sort of the first version. When we first rolled out transaction ID self-check2, uh, here's my schema for this table T. Uh, I've got a client ID. So what I've got is I've got thousands of clients logical clients, and each of them is, is asynchronously dumping work into the system. Each client has its own partition, its own little world in the database that has an ID. So the clients don't trample over each other. Their operations do because it's dumping asynchronous work at us, but it's many, many clients all, all separate and parallel. So for a given client ID, I've got row IDs. Uh, so I can have several rows for a given client. Um, I've got a transaction ID and a timestamp. Uh, and I'm going to get to those a little bit next. Uh, a previous transaction ID, you can probably see where that's going. Um, a, a hash of all of the rows at the time of insertion that, were, that belong to this client. Um, and a, a counter that we can increment, because counting in distributed systems is apparently hard. Uh, so the procedure, the simplified pseudocode version, looks a little bit like this. And I kept the schema in the corner. Um, pass in a CID, pass in a row ID. And the row ID is, is increasing. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of the rows for this CID. And I'm going to order them by the row ID descending. So the newest row before this procedure is called is at the top. Uh, the transaction ID and the timestamps are, are sort of things I get from Volt. I'm verifying by taking those and putting them into the database, by writing them, that they're deterministic across replicas. That was the original point of this app. The original app just had that one line, transaction ID gets Volt unique ID, dump into the table. Um, previous transaction ID is the, the, 
the most recent transaction in order stored into the system. So this is another case of read it and then write it. Uh, the all hash is basically hash the result of that SQL statement at the top uh, into some 64-bit integer. We're going to write that into the database. Um, so that's going to find phantom reads and other things like that. If I've got too many rows, uh, if I've got not enough rows, if I've got different views from somebody, uh, from two other people, uh, it's not necessarily that uh, more than a write check, it checks that they all see exactly the same state in the same order across all replicas. Uh, the count is just a counter. So whatever the, the counter is in the last row, I increment it by one and I write it into the system. Um, I insert that new row. And if it's greater than 10, uh, I don't know if 10 is actually the real number, but if it's greater than some fixed number, uh, delete the lowest row. And note that you should always be deleting one row. You shouldn't be, you know, defensively when I write SQL, I would always say, well, delete all the rows past 10. And I would assume that that's just one. In this case, we actually are be you know, better have zero or one row. Zero at startup and then one rows for the rest of time. To make this a little beefier, um, oh, sorry, so I can run this concurrently is important, right? From the client, I need to send many of these at once. Uh, it's not one and then the other per client. Each client just floods the system with these things. Before I get the response from one, I keep sending others. Uh, so procedure P, one way I can beef it up, I can add a should rollback. So this contested atomicity. Um, I can also add sort of constraints. One, one simple way to check data, I can ensure that all the count values are consecutive. So I can just do that. I can write some SQL. I can query this. I can look at this table. I can ensure that all the count values are consecutive. And that basically gives me an idea that, that um, my, my data model is more consistent. Um, and I can add a rollback at the end or at the mid middle. It shouldn't affect anything. Um, constraints on this, so just from this, the things I can check for, uh, there's a maximum number of rows per client. All rows for a client have consecutive row IDs and counters. Timestamps follow row ID order. They're always monotonically increasing. Uh, if the row A is the row right after row B, uh, then the row A transaction ID equals the row, which the row B transaction ID is the row A previous transaction ID. I don't know if I got that right, but you, clearly it's, you should know, know what I mean. Um, and then also test that the VoltDB APIs return the same value across replicas and replays. So I said that the real version is a lot more complex than this. Some of the things that we've done, um, we run this kind of procedure on all permutations of partition data, uh, on replicated data, mixing between partition and replicating data. Um, we do this in transactions that are, that are partitioned. So they go to one particular machine and run through like a pipeline. We do this to global transactions that include uh, data from more than one table in different uh, parts of the system. Uh, we add huge blobs to the row. This was something that we did. Um, one thing we noticed is that the first version of this, the data sizes are pretty small. And so when we'd fail the system and we'd recover it, it would recover almost instantly, uh, which is not interesting. So we add really, really big blobs to these rows sometimes. That's a tunable. We can do it with different sizes. We add tables that all they have is just 20 gigabytes of data. Um, and all these things, what they do is they slow down your recovery, and they make it more likely that you're going to hit race conditions. We've added uh, mayhem threads. Um, when they say naming is hard in computer science. Uh, that, that send ad hoc SQL. These are not transaction, uh, pr big procedures that have logic in them. These are just single SQL statements that read something and write something. Um, and we have verifiers for the mayhem threads that what they're doing makes sense. Uh, so that schema gets extended quite a bit with lots of other information so that we can do cross-table operations. Uh, we can have uh, values in that schema that get modified by the ad hoc SQL statements. Uh, we've added joins and dimension tables. Uh, this found bugs. This was added after I stopped working on this project. Um, I'm not sure what the bugs were, but I'm sure they were gross and horrible. Um, so this is all on GitHub. This transaction ID self-check2 code is in VoltDB, test, test apps. Uh, you know, a little bit buried in our repo, but it's all permissively licensed. All the things we actually run every day are in here, along with uh, 34 other workloads that we run. Um, not all of them every day, but frequently. Some of them are designed to test different things. This is sort of our go-to, but we have a lot of different sort of workloads that we do different things. Um, environmental tweaks. We certainly run, one of the things about having this nice workload that we sort of can run, we run it on different operating systems, different Java versions, different VM hosts, different clouds. Uh, we have lots of different hardware. We have sort of a closet of weirdness uh, at, at Volt, and we make sure that we run it on lots of different hardware, lots of different uh, you know, physical networking devices is important. 
Um, because we're running on top of a system, because we've got control of everything, we can use lots of fault injection tools to inject faults into this system. So this is more than just, you know, yeah, we, we can kill servers or kill multiple servers. Yeah, we can kill the whole thing and bring it back. Um, this is things like we can inject weird latency or we can just slow down latency. Uh, we can inject disk faults, uh, disk latency into the system. Um, and all these things help us uh, find, find bugs with, with Volt. Uh, and certainly, again, mixing these things, right? You don't just inject latency. You inject latency and you fail nodes. And you don't just fail one node. You fail several nodes. So uh, I talked about the, the committed tuple checker, uh, what we do to do this. Uh, each client, and there can be thousands of clients, uh, knows the last sent transaction and the last acknowledged transaction. So it's like the oracle here. Um, when we're running with synchronous durability, the checker makes sure that anything that was confirmed to the client actually got written. So at startup, it sort of just goes in this mode where it says, I'm checking. It makes queries against the system. It basically looks, well, give me all the rows for my, for my CID. Here's my CID. It comes back. It says, yeah, all the ones that I expected to be here are here. Maybe some additional ones are here that you didn't tell me about, but that's fine in terms of ACID. Um, but at least all the ones you've committed to me, committed, are there. Uh, when running a with asynchronous disk persistence and we fail the whole cluster, either you know, all at once or by just killing one too many nodes, um, we have to verify that few, uh, one of our two bounds, either fewer than a specific number of transactions are missing and or a specific window of time is missing. Uh, for this, so one of the catches here is there's lots and lots of clients. Um, and so for all of them, the total missing transactions has to be whatever you've configured your Volt to run at. I think by default it's like 200 or something. But uh, the total has to be less than that number. So we have to sum all of the missing transactions across all the clients. That one we can at least do definitively. The roughly specific window of time, we just do a best effort because suddenly we're dealing with wall clocks. Uh, if a customer says that I want to lose no more than 200 milliseconds of data, um, we do our best to make sure that we're in that 200 millisecond ballpark. Um, it's not, you know, given wall clocks aren't terrible, we're not going to be like 400 milliseconds off. But if we miss one or two, uh, that would be hard to tell with that. Um, but typically if you're running asynchronous and you've got 200 milliseconds, missing one or two transactions is kind of the point. Um, and this is a lot of work. This took uh, a, a long time um, and it, it's, it's been very valuable for us uh, to trust our system. Uh, a big advantage we get from this, uh, anyone can extend this. So I was on a project where we uh, changed the coordination for bulk ingestion, right? We, did, we wanted to make something sort of specific hooks for bulk ingestion so that we could go a lot faster. Uh, and we use this now for all of our CSV loading, our Kafka loading, um, all kinds of things, um, and it makes things faster. We basically added threads that use bulk ingestion into transaction ID self-check two, and then we added other threads and made sure that other processes uh, were intertwined with that, those writes. So we had those read all the values and write those values to other places from the bulk loading. Um, the neat thing is this found bugs during development and it found bugs immediately. So it's like we added it to transaction ID self-check two, we ran it, it failed immediately, we fixed a bug, we ran it again, it failed immediately somewhere else. Tremendously, tremendously helpful. Uh, it's gotten to the point where if you have bugs, it's very, very good at finding them. Um, and we do all this for all of our features that affect transactional guarantees. Um, I'm going to kind of go th quickly through this slide. We, we're ro rolling out multi-data center active-active support, and Transaction ID Self-Check 2 has been running for more than a week <laughs> on this data. Uh, so also the last bit I want to cover before I'm done um, is uh, what happens when you find a bug. There are two classes of bugs. There's things that happen fast, and then there are things that happen slower randomly. Uh, for the things that happen fast, typically it's pretty easy to identify and fix. We have a lot of context here. We can tell you why things deterministically fail. Um, a lot of times we have uh, a, a logical log on disk that says, here are the operations we did in this order, which leads to a reproducer. Um, for, the, for the other things, the things that happen slower randomly, um, a lot of times we're really glad that the system found those, but they are really hard to debug. And this is something where we could build better tools to get better at debugging those things. We have built a lot of better tools. A lot of the work in this kind of system goes towards how do we find those bugs where uh, something, somebody commits something and then maybe somebody commits something else later and then maybe a few days later it fails um, when you're running in KVM with transparent huge pages on, right? Those kind of things are just killer bugs. Um, so we're working on better tools to kind of figure those things out. But at the same time, we're really grateful when the system finds those things because it, it's, it's really terrifying when customers find them. Um, so I can say, in conclusion, sort of, 
Um, hopefully, uh, you know, I would do this again if I had the chance. I think that we made a lot of really good decisions. Um, but there are clear trade-offs that we made. Hopefully, we've explained some of the trade-offs in terms of testing, in terms of performance. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about anything else. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate you coming.